preparing, Lord God, in hospitals, nursing homes, preparing in schools, Lord God, to, to be a shelter for people that are struggling through the storm. And God, I pray this church is a place that's just like that. This is a church that will help people in the middle of the storms of life. It will be there for people, Lord God, when, when life is falling apart, when the hurricane is bearing down on people's lives. Lord God, may they know that this is a place that they can call, a place that they know that people are going to love them and care for them and encourage them and help them through the storm that they find themselves in the middle of. May we be a place of refuge a refuge where people's eyes can be open, where they can see and know the truth and realize that the truth has a name, and that name is Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that changes things. And God, I want to thank you that you are the center of this church, the center of all we do, the center of who we are. So Jesus, help us. Help us to always be a refuge. A refuge for storm victims. A refuge for middle of pain. A refuge for those who suffer. God, I pray today that you will open our eyes to see clearly. God, we need a clear vision of who Jesus is. Because that vision will change the way we live our lives. So Lord, I pray through this message today that you will help us to have a clear mental picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done so we can live our lives accordingly. God, thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord, for every person that's present today. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to every single person right where they're at, right in their place of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you. Thank you for picking out the music for us today, David. I appreciate it. Um, he had no idea what I was preaching on, but the, the songs couldn't go any better. Holy Spirit's been doing that. Got a letter today in the mail before I get started in the message. I got a letter in the mail on Team Friday that opened up the mail a little bit ago. It's from the Roman Church of the Brethren. Some of you don't know the history of this congregation, but 19 years ago, this church was about ready to close its doors, and God did a work here that was just so amazing. And He brought two other churches to partner with us: the Roman Church of the Brethren, the Mexico Church of the Brethren. The Roman Church of the Brethren has since they helped us 19 years ago, has really um, lost a lot of their membership. A lot of people have gone to be with the Lord. They're, they're down to three people out of that congregation. Three people is all that's a part of that church. Um, and they, they sent us a check um, on Friday for $1,000 to put towards our debt um, on our church. I was just totally poor a minute ago when I saw that. And they said that uh, uh, we, we have this tree of life back in the back. We're going to put a nice little plaque um, in remembrance of the Rowan Church of the Brother that's helped us um, to overcome this. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> Remember last Sunday, my prayer was that uh, by the time we have this offering a uh, week from Sunday, two more weeks, that we can just get this debt behind us because God's got bigger plans for us than debt. Um, there's many things that God wants us to do for his kingdom. So we will put that behind us. So keep that in your thoughts and your prayers for the next few days. How God can use you to help us to, to put this, this behind us. So that was just, just a huge blessing. And, you know, God works in such a mysterious way sometimes. And uh, that was just a, just a huge blessing. Blur. Give me one word. Blur. What do you think of when you think of that word, Blur. Webster says that a blur is to make or become unclear or less distinct. It's a haze, unfocused, obscure. The noun form means a thing that cannot be seen clearly. I spent many years of my life living in a blur. Um, the reason um, was that I couldn't see the chalkboard that was in front of my eyes when I was kindergarten first grade, um, I, I thought that I was just dumb, uh, had a hard time reading, had a hard time understanding what the teacher was trying to teach me, and, and the reason was my eyes. They were blurry. When, when I looked at the board, what I saw was just a big mass of, of blur. What I needed was glasses, but nobody knew at that moment that I needed glasses. So today I just kind of want to maybe help you out a little bit and see if you need glasses. 
Um, who do you see up here? You're one of two choices. Either you're going to see more of Albert Einstein, or you're going to see more of Marilyn Monroe. And if you're too young, you don't know who those people are. More of a guy or more of a girl <laughs> on the picture. And when I first saw this, I thought, you know, I see, I see Albert Einstein. When I went like this, I go, oh my gosh, it's Marilyn Monroe. And, and for me, it's just as simple as going like this. There's one, there's the other. Here's one, there's the other. And some of you are doing the same thing right now. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's so cool. How'd they do that? No, it's not of the devil. You know, it's, it's not magic or anything like that. They took two pictures, transposed them, one with light, one with dark. And if you have bad eyes, you're more likely to see Marilyn Monroe on the screen. If you have good eyes, you're more likely to see Albert Einstein. And some of you are going, if I look at a different screen, it's different. Yeah, that's, that's the way that works, too. You know, first service, I couldn't even quit talking either. <laughs> it's like the message was over right at that point, and that was it. For years, I was living in a blur, and I had no idea that I wasn't seeing things correctly. That, that, that's the problem, folks, okay? I, I, I see this, this billboard lately saying that your kids don't know that this isn't right. I don't know if you've seen that billboard out there. That's going to be a and, and they don't know it. If you don't know what it's supposed to look like, you assume that that's the way it's supposed to be. And I was under the assumption, I was under the assumption most of my kindergarten life and my first grade life that I just wasn't smart enough to get it. But that really wasn't what the issue was. The issue was I was living my life in a blur. And that blur affected what I believed, even about myself. <laughs> Blind. 
blind. He couldn't see. Now, we don't know why. We don't know how the man came, became blind. We don't know if something happened if he was born that way, if something happened later on in life. We don't know if it was a sickness or a disease. We just know that the guy's blind, and some of his friends bring this blind guy to Jesus. And Jesus does something that's incredibly weird. He takes the man outside of the city before he heals him. And I begin to wonder, what, why, why is Jesus doing Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus can do whatever he wants to do. Why does he take the guy outside of the city? What is the reason for it? Well, I, I, it's funny. I, I'm studying for this message the last couple of weeks, and I'm reading a book over on the side, reading a book for class. And this book is about the different kinds of genre of scripture that we, genre we find in scripture. We've got, we've got poetical stuff, we've got <coughs> historical stuff, we've got apocalyptic stuff. One of the things we have is parable. And the Bible is filled with parables. Do you know what a parable is? A parable is a story within a story. There's a story that has a meaning behind it, but then there's this deeper story that's underneath of it. And he said that you've got to look in the Bible to find these parables. Because not all of them actually begin with, this is a parable. Sometimes it doesn't say that. You've got to look for the parable. Now, there's three types of parables. There's a code parable. That means you have to decipher what the meaning is behind the parable. There's the story, and you've got to look into it and try to figure out what it means. The second is a vessel. That means it contains the truth. And you have to look into the parable to find out what the truth is. The third one is an object of art. That means the more you look at the parable from different angles, from different ways, it gets deeper and broader and has more meaning to it. It's just so much packed. The entire book of Ruth is a parable. It's a story. that work together. And the more you look, the deeper it gets. Well, well the parable I'm here to share with you, the story about this man, is actually a parable. It's a code. It's a code. And if it's a code, you've got to look for some code words to help you understand that it's more than just a story. Let me give you some code words. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? I've underlined a few sections of this. The one I want to talk about first is the word village here. It's, it's funny, in English, um, we have a word for town, a word for city, a word for village. But in Greek, you don't have that. In Greek, there is one word that talks about a dwelling place. And if you lived in a small village like Bethsaida, it's a smaller area, and so they would use the word in English as village, but in Greek, it would just be one word that means a place where people dwell. Um, if you want to go a little bit farther, you can see that there's towns... And there are cities. That whenever it talks about Bethlehem, it talks about a town. And whenever we're talking about a city, we go, Jerusalem was a big place. It was like a city. So we see the word city. But, but if you look at that word village right there, you can replace the word town, village, or city. It really wouldn't make any difference in Greek because it's all the same. Now, now, I tell you that because I find it interesting that they took the man, led him outside the city, and spit on him. If you know your Bibles a little bit, let me just say this again. They took the man, led him outside the city, and spit on him. Does there any other story in Scripture that you could kind of begin to pull together and say, oh gosh, that sounds kind of familiar. If you don't know the story, let me just tell you the story. They took Jesus outside of the city gate and hung him on a cross, and they spit on on him. Now all these are code words to get you to say there's something deeper in this story. And I gotta understand what the deeper part is because the deeper part is to understand the the parable, the truth that Jesus wants to give to us. The next part that I saw is, is, is Jesus asked the guy a question. Do you see anything? And I began to wonder, why in the world does Jesus ask the guy the question, do you see anything? That seems weird to me. You know why it seems weird to me? Let's go back, let's go back a couple of weeks here real quick. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a young girl who was demon-possessed. Not here in the Bible story. There was a young girl who was demon-possessed, and the mother wanted the girl to be healed. And Jesus cast the demon out of the girl. Now, remember where the girl was at? She was in another town over here, and Jesus is over here. And Jesus says to the mother, go home, your daughter has been healed. 
Now, according to this story, Jesus would have had to head to the other town, ask the girl, hey, is the demon still there? No, the demon's gone. Okay, we're good. But Jesus didn't do that, right? Because Jesus knew that the girl had been healed. Or how about the guy who was the deaf mute just a few weeks ago? And Jesus put his fingers in his ears, touched his tongue. The guy could speak. And Jesus didn't say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? He doesn't do that, does he? Because Jesus knew that the man could hear. And what about the lady back in, Mark, or back in Mark chapter 6 that had the issue of bleeding for 12 years? And she came up, she touched the hem of his garment. And as she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus didn't say, hey, go and see if the bleeding stopped. He says, go home when your fingers pick you up. Now, now, all that is the case. And if you look at the rest of Jesus' healing, he, he always just proclaims the healing. Why is it here he asks the question, do you see anything? Can I tell you what? Jesus is still fully God at this moment in time. Jesus still knows the situation. So this has nothing to do with Jesus trying to find out the answer. Jesus knows the answer. But the people around Jesus don't. So it's another clue that something's going on here. Something that's a little deeper. Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. And his eyes were open, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, now here, here's another sign. Why is it that Jesus had to touch the man twice? Why did the healing not work the first time? I mean, he tried to heal the guy, he couldn't heal the guy, so he tried again. Is there a lack of faith? Is Jesus having a bad day? You know, is it just that Jesus couldn't, couldn't make it happen the first time? Let's try again. Is that, is that what's going on here? Is this not the Son of God? Is this not God in the flesh? Is this not the guy who created the heavens and the earth, the sky and the sea? Is this the guy who spoke the worlds into existence and he's having trouble with this guy? I, I don't think that's the issue, do you? I don't think it's a lack of faith. I don't think it's a lack of ability. There evidently is something going on in this story that Jesus needs the disciples to understand. There's a man who has been spit on outside the city who didn't see clearly, who couldn't see at all, and then he kind of saw, and he was touched by Jesus, and he saw everything clearly. Now, I, I think we could probably take that story and run with it, but we don't have to because the Bible does. The Bible is going to give us three illustrations now of the blind, those who don't see clearly, and those who see clearly. The Bible's going to take this one illustration, this one parable, and it's going to flesh it out for us so we know...